Hi, I'm Madeline Polly. Currently, I'm involved in extracurriculars like cross country and track, band, and math club. Beyond my extracurriculars, I spend a lot of time with homework and studying. My busy schedule doesn't allow for much time allotted to hobbies. As a kid, writing stories was what I did with a significant amount of my free time. I would spend hours with journals and diaries, but since then I have stopped making time for it. I also watch shows like Criminal Minds and Dexter, and I read a ton of Stephen King and Dean Koontz novels. This gave me the idea for the topic I decided to research, serial killers. To understand my topic, let's watch a short TV special. Hello, Illinois. Today we will be having a special on one topic I know viewers are dying to hear about. What turns a person into a serial killer? We have with us on video call Dr. Thomas Bouchard, a key researcher in the Minnesota Twin Study. Can you tell us a little bit about your findings, Dr. Bouchard? Sure, Jan. Here at the University of Minnesota, we looked at all kinds of twins, but the most interesting research came from monozygotic or identical twins. Specifically, we looked at identical twins that had been separated at birth and raised separately. We found that when one of these twins exhibited sensation-seeking behavior, in most cases, so did the other twin. And what exactly is sensation-seeking behavior? Sensation-seeking behavior is exactly what it sounds like. It's the tendency to chase extreme feelings of thrill and excitement. I see. So what's the significance of both twins exhibiting the sensation-seeking behavior? Basically, it implies that sensation-seeking behavior is genetic. Since these twins were raised in separate environments, the only variable they had in common was genetics. So that means that sensation-seeking behavior is at least partially genetic. Thanks, Dr. Bouchard. Now let's talk to our serial killer expert to hear how this relates to serial killers. The reason serial killers commit their acts is because they are trying to feel something that ordinary life cannot give them. In these instances, they are exhibiting sensation-seeking behavior. And since this behavior is somewhat genetic, it means that some people are born with the predisposition to kill. And now we will take a deeper look into the mental issues that are common in serial killers. Surprisingly, these have more to do with environment than genetics. To look at how these issues develop, let's talk to a real-life psychologist. New time travel technologies have allowed us to talk to Mary Ainsworth about her 1969 experiments. Dr. Ainsworth, can you tell us about your experiments? I'd love to. In my experiments, a mother and her child were brought into a room with toys in it. They began to play with the toys, and a little while later, the mother would leave the room and a stranger would replace her. Then, not too long after, the mother would return. Securely attached babies began to cry when their mother left, but were comforted and stopped crying when she returned. Ambivalently attached children began to cry when their mother left, but continued to cry even when she returned. And lastly, insecurely attached babies did not care when their mother left. And how are these attachments formed? They're formed in early infancy based on primarily how much attention the mother gives the child. If the child does not receive attention when it cries out for help, it cannot form a secure attachment. This is especially common in households of abuse. And how does this lack of attachment influence them in later life? Children who do not form healthy attachments go on to always feel insecure in their relationships in later life. They fail to develop key emotions like empathy, and this will lead them to have antisocial personalities. Let's hear what our serial killer expert has to say about this. The most common mental deficiency among serial killers is antisocial personality, and in a survey of 50 serial killers, 68% reported that they had experienced some sort of abuse in their early childhoods. It is likely that this abuse led them to lack attachment, which caused them to develop antisocial personalities in later life. So, overall, we can conclude that in some ways, becoming a serial killer is out of a person's control. Wow, that was really interesting. This information gives me the background I need for my main character's backstory. I will be telling a story from the perspective of a serial killer, and I aim to get my audience to sympathize for him by focusing on how he got to be the way he is. My goal is to write a 50-page short story, which is more than I have ever written before. It will mean a lot to me to be able to write a story this long with a plot from start to finish, especially since I have not dedicated this much time to writing since I was a kid. Hopefully, it will inspire me to make more time for writing in my future. I know college will only make my life more stressful, so my goal is to be able to use writing as a stress-relieving hobby.